Wow, what an honor. That's, that, that band decided to unite just for us. They hadn't been together. and It's a perfect name, the final vision. If you finally made it through this world and you were rising up toward the light, wouldn't you love to hear the angels singing <laughs> and harmonizing that way? It's like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? <laughs> You can feel home. You can just feel through those harmonies. Like there's such a call there. There's something inside that's yearning for what is natural. And when we hear those beautiful harmonies, it seems kind of ethereal. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the natural. And what has seemed to be these very difficult emotions and perceptions in time and space, you know, those aren't natural. We're, we have projected our identity into something that's not natural at all. And yet, it all depends on our purpose. So, we could say, uh, well, the world may seem like a place of fear, but actually, if, if it's true that what Jesus says, that the world is backwards and upside down, then it can't really be a place of fear. It must just be an opportunity to love and forgive. That's all this world is. And every single encounter in every single moment of the day is nothing more than an opportunity to forgive. An opportunity to remember. An opportunity to open our hearts up, open our minds up, and be shown what is real and what is true. I mentioned last night that Einstein and Jesus had some very, very similar ideas about this cosmos. Uh, Einstein's very famous for his theory of relativity, but basically Einstein was, was teaching that, um, that, that time and space are, are not absolutes. And for a lot of people, they were like, mm, it seems pretty fixed. Uh, Time seems pretty fixed, and space seems fixed. It doesn't seem entirely subjective. It doesn't seem entirely perceptual. And yet, Einstein said, no, they, time and space are, are uh, variable. There's other factors that are involved in that. And um, it's just for human beings, you know, when we get, we adapt, our mind has adapted and adjusted to this very fake environment. And now what is extremely fake and, and fictional is now accustomed as, it's called real. When I've heard people say, oh, come on, these teachings are far out. Come on, come back to reality. But this world is assumed to be the reality. <laughs> and it's backwards and upside down. For example, you know, we we tend to think of time as something pretty constant. Like if I said, if I said the one second or one minute in Holland is the same as in France and Belgium and China and in all parts of the world, you know, most people would say, yeah, yeah, a second is still a second. We don't say a Chinese second or a a, a Dutch second or a British second. I'll be there in a British 10 minutes. You know, sometimes I do get that when I'm in Mexico. They say, oh, you're on Mexico time. They say, what's that mean? Manana, manana. <laughs> I say, what's that mean? They say, not now. <laughs> <laughs> when will this be repaired? Manana, manana. When do I pick it up? Not now. Come back later. <laughs> no specific time. But generally, what they've done, uh, these 
physicists have run all kinds of experiments, but they've actually taken a, a very accurate atomic clock and they've had one on the ground and then they put an atomic clock, an identical atomic clock set to the same time. So these two very precise clocks and they're telling the same time and then they, they leave one on the ground on Earth and they put one up in a supersonic jet and they fly it in a supersonic jet around the world. They bring it down, they put the two clocks together, they're not the same. Whoa. They're not the same. And then, if you, we know that, that the, the perception of astronauts is very different when they go into orbit, or they go to the moon, or they're in what we call outer space, <laughs> a little bit above the earth. Uh, basically, um, they, they notice with this sense of weightlessness, it's a very different experience to be a human without much gravity. You know, where your food is floating by, if you barf, your barf floats by, things don't tend to go down. <laughs> they just, and the bodies feel very different when, they're, when there's less gravity. But if you imagine going to closer and closer to a black hole, what they've discovered is the whole perception of time, of, of years, of time as humans perceive it, is extremely different, massively different. Not, not a little different, but vastly different. And so what I want to say is, we have to start to remember that this world is a projection, and so when the mind is asleep and dreaming, the closest, closest thing really to the projector room, I'll say, of your mind, is the body. So, uh, that's why you can trust that how you feel in the body is like a barometer of how your mind's doing. Uh, you may wonder what, when I'm feeling uncomfortable, when I feel different types of discomfort, that is an opportunity to choose a miracle. If you have a, an irritation, an annoyance, a, a headache, some stiffness, some soreness, you're fatigued, whatever, then that's just a projection of a state of mind that's projected onto the body. The body is so much identified as the identity now, and the spirit is completely pushed out of awareness through the amnesia, that, that a lot of times when we say, I feel, we're talking about how the personality feels or about how the body feels. And then Jesus assures us that personalities don't feel and that bodies don't feel. There you go. Here we go. This starts to get really deep. What do you mean the body doesn't feel? That really contradicts a lot of human experience. The body doesn't feel at all, but he's saying, no, your mind tells your body what to feel. It's all in the mind. That's why Jesus says, all illness is mental illness. There is no such thing as physical illness, because that was a projection. A lot of times people are very much concerned with, you know, they say, please talk about healing the body. And Jesus says at one point in the Course, the mind was sick that thought the body could be sick. Wow. That's a powerful line if you really start to just take it in. The mind was sick that thought the body could be sick. It's mesmerism. That's what Mary Baker Eddy called it. It's, it's like hypnotism. It's mesmerism. It's hallucination. It's a figment of imagination and the meaning and the feelings which are experienced in the sleeping mind are projected to the body. And that's why so many cures are sought for and Jesus calls this magic when you try to attempt to adjust and to come back to a place of comfort using what he calls external means. Anything that's believed to be outside the mind is external means. And so we have to remember though that everything is the result of a decision. So, so if someone is choosing to feel ill, you have to remember that they're choosing that because they're afraid of something worse. 
In other words, people say to me, who, would, who in their right mind would choose to be sick? And I'm like, oh, you got it right there. No one in their right mind would choose to be sick. Sickness is always a wrong-minded decision, and it must be if sickness is chosen, if feelings are chosen, ill feelings, or even symptoms, that it must be that that is a choice between two things, and the other thing would be a lot worse. And what's a lot worse to the ego is, is God, is the light. It's terrified of the light. It's terrified of awakening. It actually feels like, like the light is the enemy. That if, if the mind turns toward the light, then the ego will cease to exist. And that's true. <laughs> so it's like a, a fearful, threatening experience. So Jesus tells us in Lesson 136, when love comes close into your experience and you're too afraid of the love, it's like a sickness is a mechanism for, for saying, oh no, no, no thank you. Look at me, I'm vulnerable. And it's like calling forth a witness. Oh, I'm, I'm frail, I'm weak, leave me alone. Uh, or sometimes p children who are afraid of getting struck by a parent will say, please don't do it to me, I'll do it to myself. I'll mitigate a much greater punishment by, I'll do it to myself. And this is what's going on. It's very insane, but this is what's going on in the mind in terms of sickness. It's too afraid of healing. It would rather be right about being little and tiny and small than be happy in heaven. And that's basically what it's coming down to. So, We've had some really, really deep teachings this week and voice liberation yesterday. And I felt today we would start to bring it back to what you're feeling, what are your questions in terms of practicality, in terms of how I perceive myself in the world, what are the steps for me to go inward to the light. What are the steps that are practical for me to help me loosen from this faulty perception of myself and everyone? How can I loosen from this false perception and come closer and closer to more of a healed and holistic perception? Time and space are relative and Jesus says, yes, and time and space are the same illusion. It's like the closer it seems to be to the projector, you think of it as space. And the farther away from the projector, you think of it as time. But they're, they're like two dimensions of the same error. Even time and space are not different in that they're two aspects or dimensions of the same error. Time and space are both projections. For example, if you held your finger out like this in front of your nose, you wouldn't describe the distance between your nose and your finger, usually in terms of time. You wouldn't say, I think that's uh, 0.4 milliseconds away. My finger is point four milliseconds away from my nose. You would probably describe it in terms of inches or centimeters, depending on the culture. The closer it is to the projector, you think of it in terms of, dist of, of distance. And then the farther away, like we'll say your dining hall, you know, if I said, how far away is the dining hall from the main area, arena, where we are now, you could, you could tell me in terms of, uh, you could say it's like a two-minute walk. Or you could say it's so many meters or so many feet. You could describe it either way because you notice with the finger, you don't even think of it in terms of, it would be ridiculous, you know. How far is your toe from your nose? Oh, it's about half a second. You know, people would say. They're, 
But if you said, oh, it's so many feet or, you know, a meter and so on and so forth, the people would recognize it. So, and then when we think of it as like the stars, what do scientists, when they talk about stars, because stars are so many millions of miles or kilometers away from the perceiver, that we talk about them as light years. They're entirely described in terms of time. That's what Jesus means. The farther it is away from the projector, you think of it in terms of, of that. And this is the same with people. Like I, I was talking yesterday, and if I came in here and I said, okay, I've got some questions for you. Uh, how far away is Sherlock Holmes? You'd say, what do you mean? How, how far is Sherlock Holmes? Well, he's been dead for, you know, or, or Albert Einstein, or, or Gandhi, or Cleopatra, or whatever, you know. How far? How far is Cleopatra? What do you mean, how far is Cleopatra? What are you talking about? But Jesus is saying time and space are the same thing. So when we would say, we wouldn't say that uh, Cleopatra is so many kilometers away, people would think you really were, have lost it. They said she's been dead and gone for years, decades, <laughs> centuries. <laughs> but, but it's the same error. Even those things that, like Cleopatra that pass away and were on the screen there for a while and now they disappear from the screen, they're still all part of the projection. And time and space are the same error. And so in the end, that's why we have to forgive because it, as long as we believe in the ego and we try to project the ego to get rid of it, then we're going to be perceiving a, a cosmos of time and space that seems to be outside of us. And the only way that the projection disappears is through forgiveness, through the atonement, where you start to see it's all mind. It's been a, a gigantic hallucination. And it's been really convincing too, you know, when, when you wake up in the morning, get out of bed, fix a cup of coffee, brush your teeth, you know, get showered, get dressed, go through the, the rituals, you're, you're usually not thinking of the stuff that I'm, I'm talking about now. This, that doesn't seem practical. It seems like you're just dealing with the, that tiny, tiny, tiny aspect of the hallucination <laughs> that seems to be the personality self and the time frame. What does the person have to do today? Where do I have to go? You see, those seem to be the practical things, but it's on a, a very, very tiny scale in the overall cosmic sense of things. I happen to really enjoy philosophy because I, I have always pondered the deeper questions, you know, around existence. And, uh, yeah, nothing really prepared me for A Course in Miracles because, you know, when you get in to the Course, you know, it's basically saying that, that the cosmos doesn't really exist. Uh, that's, talk about a stretch. Uh, I always talk about how early on I was listening to a lot of cassette tapes of uh, of Ken Wapnick and uh, I remember I was doing the dishes one time and I've told this story where I'm doing the dishes and I'm listening and somebody's asking Ken a question on the tape. Does the course, what does the course say about life on other planets? And Ken says, well the course says there's no life on this planet. <laughs> and I just... Oh, I just smiled and I just was like, yep, okay, this is radical. This is radical. But, but the more you give yourself over to what it's actually sharing, he's saying that what the Course says, there is no life outside of he heaven because God is the creator of life. And life is God and life is with God and Christ is with God and life is light and life is love and anything other than that Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That's just the introduction to the Course. 
But when you really start to relax into that, you start to realize, wow, I need to be shown that I actually have no problems, that I've been hallucinating, I've been believing I had problems, and I've been hallucinating problems, but I don't actually have any problems. Truly, if I go into this moment deeply enough, I will see I am loved, I am safe, I am home. So today what I thought I would do is uh, we have we have some cha our chairs up here for questions and interactions of things that maybe through the voice liberation some emotions came up. Maybe throughout this week things have started to come up. Maybe you went to sleep last night with a few questions starting to bubble up into your mind or something that came to you during the movie or after the movie, but I thought we would use the day just for the a heart to heart joining and connecting on this from where you perceive yourself because that is the most practical thing. I assure you that the Spirit loves you so dearly and the Spirit and, and all the angels rejoice at every little effort you make to forgive, at every little contribution you make in your mind to forgiveness for, for the whole. There is great rejoicing even for the tiniest one. You shouldn't be concerned that you're not worthy to do this. You shouldn't be concerned you haven't, haven't really you know, given, given your life over or done this. You shouldn't compare yourself to anything. All those things really don't mean anything. They don't amount to anything. I mean, there's a lot of cliches even that, that we grow up hearing uh, and and even the cliches aren't, aren't true or aren't entirely true and they need to be tweaked a little bit and that's why we have these conferences and these interactions. It's, it's fun to come together. I love going all over the world and meeting people all over the world because I don't believe in problems and sometimes they tell me they do believe in problems and I say, well, let's just sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk and we usually end up laughing and, and you know, they come around to my point of view that there are no problems or at least momentarily they're willing to <laughs> merge in happiness Cause, because they want to be happy. They want to feel the love. So we, you know, I've had so many dinners and lunches where I just sit there and I was traveling one time through Pennsylvania and a woman called me up on my cell phone. She said, where are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm coming through this town, I'm coming across from Wheeling, West Virginia and coming across the, the bridge to, uh, into Ohio. She said, oh, I know this restaurant. Take this exit and I'll meet you for lunch. I said, okay. So I drive over the river, get off at the exit, come, I, I go to the restaurant, I'd never met the woman before. She, oh, let me give you a big hug. And, oh, come on, let's go over. Let's have lunch. Okay, okay. So I sit down at the booth and she leans in the booth and she says, what are you experiencing right now? And I said, that it's just us. It's only us and, and the whole world is with us. But it's only us. It's right, right now, this is, I said, it's so wonderful, it's so, she said, okay, you want to order something? So, yeah. so we talk. And then I said, I said, just imagine if you could start thinking that, that there is a no world apart from your thoughts. Like, for example, let's use us. Let's say that this barn and this stage and this room, imagine that you can, you can look around, you can perceive the lights and you can feel the temperature and you can look around at the bodies and everything. But just imagine that there was nothing outside of this room. There, if somebody said Amsterdam, you would say, no, there is no Amsterdam. But you, what about the United States? No, there is no United States. China? No, there's no China. The moon? No. The sun, no, it's not, doesn't. Because everything is just a thought in your mind. Remember, it's all a projection. 
and ideas leave not their source. So you have got with you now a world of ideas and you may think that there are actual cities out there and actual people and actual countries and you may think there's an environmental struggle going on and political struggles and and warfare and all these different things but Jesus tells us in Lesson 132, there is no world apart from what you think. So you can imagine things, but it doesn't make them real. And you can see how relaxing that gets. When, G when John Lennon, remember when John Lennon made that song, Imagine? I was just, I had the biggest smile on my face when I heard Imagine. Imagine there's no country. I wonder if you can. I had to, I had to play that a few times. I, I, okay, I'll try. There's no country. Ooh, starting to feel better. I had projected a lot of things onto those countries. You know, imagine there's no government. You know, imagine that this is a world of imagination and it's just in your mind and the only way you can heal it is by bringing it back to where it seems to be. Then you can let it go. But you can't let it go if you think it's out there. You know, All you can do is point the finger and blame and this should be different and I don't like this politician and why are they doing this to the animals and why are they doing this to the, the environment and the ozone layer and why, why, why? You know, you have a choice to project and get all in a huff. What was the Beatles, John Lennon, Strawberry Fields Forever? There's nothing to get huff about. You either get into a huff by projecting or you see there's nothing to get huff about, hung about. I think it's hung. You don't, you don't have to get hung up. <coughs> hung up. So for me... That is a way to start to bring your mind closer and closer to your thoughts and just start to look at your thoughts and start to really think to yourself, are these thoughts really contributing to my happiness and my joy and peace of mind or not? And perhaps if the thoughts are not feeling good and joyful and, and contributing to your peace of mind, you might consider letting, letting them go. Because our workbook lesson today, if you follow along day by day, is I can elect to change all thoughts that hurt. You can do that. You actually can do that with everything. You can all elect to change all thoughts that hurt. Doesn't that seem so intuitively helpful to know that if, if you had the power to believe in them, you must have the power to, to let them go or to not believe in them anymore. You, you can reverse whatever seemed to go on and, and you don't even have to be concerned about how long it took to become so seduced with these dark thoughts. You, you, you don't even care how long it took to get this way. You just want to be free of it. You want to come to freedom. And you come to freedom by letting go of those hurtful thoughts, attack thoughts, judgments, grievances. There's just no point in holding on to grievances when they're taking away your precious peace of mind, which is natural. You know, you, there's no point in hanging on to those anymore. And admittedly, this takes practice, you know, I know for myself, I came across A Course in Miracles in 1986, and then it was euphoric, and, and it was huge. It, was a, it made a huge impact on me, but I knew that I had to really give it my dedication for that almost, I'll say, slow and steady clearing and cleaning of the mind, unwinding. If the ego wound me in, I want to be unwound, and I'm, I'm not going to even judge the process of unwinding. I'm, I just want to go for it, and, and, and go for that experience with all my heart. And that's all I'm encouraging you to do, not to 
try to think you have to somehow force yourself to wake up. I mean, if you had a child, for example, and you, you heard noises coming and you could tell that your child was in, in their bed and they were tossing and terming, turning and they were having a nightmare, you know, you wouldn't go in and grab that child in the middle of the nightmare because if, if the child is asleep and dreaming of a monster or something, you don't grab the child and try to wake the child up too fast because if you're shaking that child, <laughs> the child may perceive the parent as part of the dream. Like the monster now is clutching, is grabbed hold of the child because when you're dreaming it seems very real. So you would just have to go in and be very gentle to wake that child up in the softest, most gentle way. That would be the most loving thing. You need to be that loving with your mind. Don't be harsh. Don't think coulda, woulda, shouldas and what have I done. I mean, there's a saying that says, time heals all wounds. Well, the only thing is, that's not entirely true. Isn't, that's a, a major cliché, I know. <laughs> time heals all wounds. But really, it should say, the Holy Spirit, Jesus' use of time, heals all wounds. Because Jesus tells us in the Course that time can waste or be wasted. So it's the purpose. What is it for? We even have to decide what time is for in order for it to benefit it. Time itself doesn't heal all wounds. It's the Spirit's use of time. The Spirit's use of the dream takes us, unwinds us from believing in the dream. It takes us all the way back to seeing we're, we're dreaming and we're the dreamer of the dream. And then we're ready to change the purpose for the dream to one of forgiveness and wake up from the dream entirely. So that just is another example about how even a lot of the cliches that a lot of us have been raised with aren't entirely true. We need wisdom. We need, we need illumination. We need lots of illumination to be helping us wake up in, in a practical way. Okay, well, I see now we're complete. We've got <laughs> a, a whole row, perfectly timed. <laughs> and uh, Lilo is getting the, the, the microphone. There we go, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um... I feel a bit scared right now. My heart is pounding. Yes. Oh, that's good. Just take take a moment, just take a deep breath and just relax. And there's some I don't know, some being touched. I don't really know what to say. I just felt I should come up here. It was a big, big barrier to come here. Oh, that's beautiful that you just, even to come up and put yourself in the chair, you know. <laughs> It's so beautiful. It shows so so much courage just to say, I feel this way, but I won't let this feeling stop me from... Yeah, that's yeah. exactly... I just want to go to the light. That's what I felt. Like, like there's this tendency to sit in the back, and I just felt like, no, I want to go to the light. And, but at the same time, it's so scary to even talk to you, that's scary, or see the other persons, Kirsten. It's like, oh, I want to go to that light, but so, so much fear. Yes. <coughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 
guess I just want to go to the light. <laughs> That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful that you just have that on your heart. We were talking about that, if you just have that desire to go to the light, and then you can relax and trust and just let everything come to you, everything be given to you to serve that one purpose, one purpose. Yeah, and also like what you were saying before about the sickness and the headache, and I was also getting this headache, like like when I get closer to the light, the headache gets stronger. I get the tendency, oh maybe I should go back and... And then you were telling that and the headache just drops. And now mm. there's not really a headache, little bit. Ah, beautiful. So thank you, I, oh. I just feel very grateful for everyone and thank all the people. Yeah, beautiful. Well why don't you just settle in there, because there's a whole row and, and you don't have to leave. You just, you just stay there and then, and then when we go down the road maybe you'll say, oh, something's coming to me now. And they'll pass the microphone back down to you. Okay. So you can just sit there and enjoy it and relax and yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi. Hi there. I want to thank you so much that you are here and have told this words because I have exactly the same feeling <laughs> and I sit there and have been waiting until the end and I've seen oh there is a chair free <laughs> is it for you you have to do this and I'm in a process since uh, since the whole days we've been here and yesterday it was uh, most important day for me because I'm so full of fears and I have been so confronted with these fears and I had the feeling I can't escape anymore. There's no chance then because there's no life. <laughs> when you don't have to do this. If, and I'm so extremely in prayer. Yesterday I, I felt it has been so much. Every day is so much put in. And I thought for me I have to, to rest a little. And I haven't go to the meditation and I have a room outside here in a and b <coughs> and I got me the time for myself and I I've come so deep in pray prayer with Jesus and I had no chance to escape anymore the voice which is speaking in me since long time and I always have put it away, but that doesn't uh, show me the way to be happy. And yesterday I had the wish, please show me the way. I'm completely open. I will be, take my body, take my eyes, <laughs> take my hands, my feet. <laughs> Show me what to do. <laughs> I give my pain, my, my fears all to you. And show me the way. I trust you. That was so strong. And I begin to do what he wants to do. What I shall do. And I come in the flow. And every second he speak to me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, sometimes I must laugh so much because he, he answers my questions with, with everything, with music, with, with song text, and since a long time. And I, 
often have to remember your words that you have told. It's the same to me. I, I can feel everything, what, what you say. It's like you are speaking what I'm feeling. And I had the experience that everyone here, everyone, is a part of me. And then yesterday, in the morning, when I've done everything, in every moment, I questioned, yes, do you want this? You want me to do this? Okay, then I do it. Because I have promised it. And it was a big challenge. And, but he... He gave me strength. He gave me... I got the feeling that he is around me everywhere I go. He was near me, beside me, over me. And always I heard, I take care for you. I'm here. I take care for you. Don't be afraid. I show you the way. And I lay in my bed before and there come so many things come. They were in me and there was a block. I was completely blocked and this block I cannot remove. And therefore I, I know I have to ask Jesus to help me. There's no other way. And, and then it, it goes... And I went, uh, I, I took a walk to here, to this location. And I was in prayer the whole time. And I want to get my phone for the way. And he said to me, no, put it in your pocket. I show you the way. And he shows me the way. And I, I was completely open to everything, to to everything, and I, I go and go, and then suddenly I had the feeling this is the wrong way. And then, okay, I have to go the right, the street right by my side, and, and yes, that's right. And I go, and then I was here, <sighs> but there was a. There was a task I have before he has given me. A task? I don't know. Um, yes, okay. <laughs> and this, this, this task was so... No. <laughs> I can't do that. Don't... No, 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 no. No, I can't do this. No. And then it came. I... T I I give you every single moment I'm on your way. And look only the steps, only the steps. And don't look what will happen. I will arrange everything for you. And I'm like, okay, I do this. And then I'm completely, I came in trust and I do that. And I'm. <laughs> I don't think any further. And I come to the castle, and then I, I ask him. <laughs> no, I, for myself, I had the question, should I go to the main gate, or should I take the way uh, when we, where we have met, in the, where the parking place is? And then he said, no, go straight on. And I go to the port, Gate, and uh, I saw over this door there was Mother Mary with his child, and every single song we had here were all my special songs <laughs> that I play with guitar and I sing, and it's every <laughs> all the songs are my favorite songs. <laughs> 
And then I was, okay, then it's the right way. I see Mother Mary and Let It Be is my song and I, I go. <laughs> I go straight through. And then I was in the garden, the wonderful garden. I, I go quite slowly. And then you take, take a seat and I take a seat and there's, I've never seen, seen before there was an angel with a guitar. <laughs> it's as if this were all special signs for me. I came in trust to follow. <sighs> and I'm com the whole time I was in, in uh, speaking with him the whole time. And when I said, no, I, I'm afraid, no, I'm afraid, he took me, he gave me an embracing and said, it's okay, everything is okay. It comes the right time for everything, it doesn't matter. I, I took you in complete, sec you are secure, completely. <sighs> Okay, I had a rose with me um, before I was in my uh, room. I have so wonderful um, woman. Uh, he is, uh, she is um, the owner of the house, and I had three roses in my in the, standing on my table. And Jesus said to me, took one rose and gave it to David. <laughs> and uh, I took it and I asked if there was a white and a, and a red rose. Uh, which rose shall I took, take? And I first take the white because I, I'm in my own thoughts. And then he said, no, took the red rose. And then I, I have with the red rose, I had... Uh, own experiences I took I have a um, recognition from a uh, place where I have been and he said to me give him this rose and say to him I have chosen the chalice well and it's because um, I think I've been there, the chalice well in Glastonbury. <laughs> and it's, he spoke with, his, with my words so that I can understand it, I think. Okay, I took the rose with me and uh, sh say me when I, shall I do this? And I, I'm, so, I'm so fearful. I have so much fear in me. I don't know why. And then I took, we have lunch. I came to lunch time, and there I've been at a table with some very nice people. And then I had the feeling I have to tell them because it begins, my fear was. I don't have to tell something. I don't have to tell something. In the morning, there's nothing I have to tell. I say it over to me, and always when I say something to someone in afterwards, I say, no, why, why did, did you say these words? And Jesus said to me, you have to tell something. You have so much to tell. Tell it. And I... <laughs> sit in this in the room with the this lovely people and I spoke to them and this uh, that have been four or five people and then I I feel insecure. This was a test for me to <laughs> speak but I had the feeling with these people you can you're sure. <laughs> Other speak 
before other people, in front of other people is too much. Okay, then speak to this. <laughs> I had this feeling. And I told my story. And I felt touched because they, yes, they uh, hear it and they give me the feeling that it is okay. No, it's not okay. It is good. They, they think, they uh, have been thankful and this was a gift for me. I, yes, the gift, I gave it and I receive it. It is the same. <sighs> okay, and then I felt better. <laughs> but I have the, the rose. <laughs> and I... Yes, I had so, so much fear. And then we go to the session and we make this ex um, exercise with fear. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> this is for me. <laughs> and in this exercise, I, I've seen my fear and... The fear was the light. I'm afraid of the light. And I can't imagine, no, it can't be. On the altar, there was a candle. You can't be afraid of a candle. And in this ex exercise, I made the experience what fear is in me for nothing, for for a wonderful thing, for something was is in all of us. It, no, we are it. We are the light. We are the light completely and nothing else exists. And this is all and all the People who are here are a part of this flame. And we have to get in fire. We are strong. We are so strong. And we can't remember this. Yes. And after this, I spoke, I had the experience when I spoke with uh, the people, I'm totally near. I let them speak and I, I'm so <laughs> with the man or woman which stand before me and I, I want to hear the story and everyone yesterday who speak to me told me my own story <laughs> and that this is another step to experience the this trust and Jesus always says to me, yes, I speak to you through everything, through every person who is here, through every thing. Through, you can trust me. There is nothing else. Your fears doesn't exist. <sighs> yes. But I've lost the rose. <laughs> <laughs> Good. No, it it served. It, it served a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's beautiful, though. You know, from what you're sharing, there's so many 
helpful aspects. I mean, first of all, to just acknowledge that that you have this connection and relationship with Jesus that's just like a it's just like a friendly connection. That's a huge thing just to, to be able to witness that because it just shows this is possible and I I would say this is a this is the way that makes it open quickly when you have that kind of intimate loving friendship with Jesus and he and you just he talks to you and you're willing to follow and follow and then to come to a conference a retreat like this where at the at the beginning he's like talking to you in your your mind but it's very safe and nurtured in there but then to open it up to start to allow it to come through in many other ways is like a huge step to go from kind of a, an autonomous self into to emerge it's almost like you're merging in a bigger way with all your brothers and sisters and that's huge too and then of course the fears come up because the it's this intuitive path that you're following is going against all the past programming you know those the voice from the past is don't say that what are you doing who do you think you are and all these you know it will just come in there because it's like you're pulling your mind's energy away from it and it's frightened that you're not going to follow the rules that it made up for you but i see from your sharing that that the really god's will is just for joy and happiness and love and freedom and and that will for us is within us it's not like we're going to find it in the world we can see reflections of it and you're getting these amazing reflections coming now and that's just you're becoming stronger in it just by allowing that but it's a beautiful witness actually for everyone that that you can have this kind of intimate experience and when the fears come up you have your companion your companion there with you saying no it's it's okay and there's no forcing anything and it'll all come at the just the right time you don't you don't even have to be concerned of the how or the where or the when or the what you just stay with that and you're speaking it up so you came to the front seat and you're speaking it great leap of faith for me for me yeah. <laughs> wow yeah. but i'm so glad i'm so happy to share it with you all what tomo uh, in the morning i had uh, spoken with a woman i have a big experience and it was it was another step to that lead me to sit here and so i'm so thankful for everyone who is here it's uh, it's beyond all words beyond all words thank you so much all love you all deeply uh, from my heart <laughs> thank you Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. Hi, David. Hi there. Um, something came up for me with the movie yesterday, as there was so much talk about this, yeah, the hypotheticals and the superposition, and at the same time, the script is written. And I've spent a long time trying to accept what that really means, where the script is written, because I had a, 
suddenly a different understanding of yeah, the events of time before I started to l listen to much of your talks because you are so firm with this, um, yeah, the concept of the script is written. But then I felt yesterday that you kind of open it up a bit and like you're talking so much about the superposition and that yeah, it's our decision that kind of collapses what actually then happens. So with our choice of purpose, then we kind of draw forth which one of all the possibilities there are. And now I'm just back to this confused state. <laughs> so I'm really... To me, there is a big contradiction in that, like... It feels like when, when we say the script is written, then we mean there is like only one path that is. That's how I interpret that, that the script is written. The things that are meant to happen, they will happen. Like if something breaks, so we meet a certain people and yeah, whatever it can be. Um, but then when what I hear from the superposition, then it feels more like some people have used the analogy of a video game, like in that video game you have all the possibilities, you know, uh, if you walk into a stairway you can go up or down and right or left and everything, and there everything is already like scripted what you can do in there, but you choose which of those. And then it feels like in that place there are several options to choose from, even in form, that the form isn't set. So I'm kind of, I feel frustrated right now and upset about that. I I really feel I'm stuck in that, yeah, as you put it, like a rock in the harder place. Like, how do these things go together? On the one hand, the script is written, and then on the other hand, we have this, the hypotheticals and the superposition and everything. And then there is this purpose is the only choice. And I'm like, how? <laughs> this is just, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a great conflict, like, um, and I feel that it's keeping me, because I can't just step back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all taken care of. That would be like glossing it over, because I really feel this is blocking me from um, relaxing into, yeah, it's all taken care of, I don't need to be in control and everything. So I really feel this is the next step to, and I've tried so many times to get an understanding that will bring me the peace, but it's not, yeah, so now it's activated again. <laughs> so. Beautiful. Oh, this is beautiful. This is, we can, we can clear, clear things up a bit too. Well, when I was talking about the noodle you know, the noodle is the script, you know, it's it's a thing. People have asked me about that line in the course, the script is written, and I'll say, well, the most important word in the script is written, is the written part, because the written is, that's just a version, the script is written is just a version of lesson number seven, I see only the past. So the noodle is all the past. Still, the question is, do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Do I want the line or do I want the point? Is really what it comes down to. Because the noodle can be turned on its side at any point. Uh, there was a time when Helen Schuckman was pondering these things about time and Jesus kind of took her in her mind and, and he took her towards time and it was a Time was actually a downward spiral in this uh, vis vision that he showed her. And it looked like it had, you know, it was broken into pieces, like people perceive time. But then he, he went with her really close, and he went all the way so close that he showed her just the right angle where she could see that it was all one thing from a different angle. From a side angle, it looked broken up. And, and from, a, from one angle, from an egoic angle, it looks like a script, it looks like a noodle, it looks, it looks linear. And from another perspective, it's not at all. So the only thing that goes above the script is written is, is you start to open up to this idea of, of simultaneity, of, 
of everything is simultaneous. Like, you have to, in the end, start to... You will not understand the script is written because it's like trying to understand the noodle and try to integrate the noodle <laughs> in some way. Like, just let me get this down. Like, is that noodle there? Or is there something else? Well, there's a different perspective that's available, but, but that takes letting go of the past, because every aspect of those potentials and superposition are all the past. Whether you arrange it in a noodle or you talk about it about superposition, all those hypotheticals were not created by God. And so you're simply following the guidance to take you to a point not of understanding time and space, or understanding the workings of this world, because this world can never be understood. It's, it's meaningless. It's, that's the first lesson of the Course workbook. Nothing I see means anything. And, and peace and understanding go together and cannot be found apart. So, in the end, it, it is about opening to an experience of this peace, of this connectedness, of this joy and this love, and actually letting go of all attempts to understand the world, or understand the distractive device. Even though you may have a different perspective, it's like you're trying to grasp and hold on to something that, that can't really be found. All you can do is surrender, like, I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, uh, how to look upon the world or upon myself, you know, that's the, that's what takes you into the experience of peace, is letting go of trying to, to know or understand anything through the apparatus of, of time or the five senses. Like I mentioned about that, the German philosopher, how do we know what we know? We know prior to time, and then when we believe in time, we don't know anymore. You know, we block the knowing. So, it does, it can feel disorienting, confusing, but the idea of, of the script as written, I would say is like a stepping stone kind of metaphor to take your mind, to, but to start to open to the idea that it's all the past. So, when you try to choose between those hypotheticals, you're, it's still an attempt to choose between something that, where there is no choice. There actually is no choice among anything of this world. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow. The ego is like, oh, because it wants there to be choice so much. And Jesus is like saying, purpose is the only choice. What is it for is the only meaningful choice. Is this, is this for forgiveness, or is this for maintaining this timeline uh, identity? It's really, it comes down to that. And so, in the end, as you go deeper with this, choosing gets simplified because you're paying a close attention to your feelings, and you're just praying and saying, I want to learn to make no decisions by myself. I want to I want to totally align with the Holy Spirit's purpose, and that's what brings about this, this transformation, this awakening. But you have to stay with the simplicity of that, because as soon as you try to figure out, it's almost like trying to figure out the, 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 the steps, the rungs on a ladder. You know, like an analyzing the rungs, Okay, script is written, that's, that's down, it's a lower rung, it's very linear. And then you go higher and higher up the ladder, and your mind is like saying, that's a fascinating ladder. I would love Jesus to understand this ladder. And Jesus is like, that's not the point of a ladder. The point of a ladder is to use it and hop off it. <laughs> The, the point of the ladder is to cast the ladder aside. And yet, you can see how this, there's a part of the mind that wants to understand, is it this rung, or is it this rung, 
or is it this rung? And as you push off from a rung, eventually you reach the top rung, and what do you do? What's the purpose of a ladder? To get you somewhere <laughs> higher. And when you go for it, you, in the end, that's why that song that played last night, you know, simply do this, simply do this, at the end, lay aside all thoughts that you have, have believed about yourself and God and everything. Hold on to nothing. Hold on to no rungs. Forget this world. Forget this ladder. Forget this course. Forget this ladder. <laughs> and come with holy, empty hands unto your God. There's no way to understand the journey. Isn't that relaxing? We can give up, give up trying to understand the, the journey. It's kind of like when people t tell me, they work with the Course for years and they go, oh, I was really loving the Course, and then when I got to the Manual for Teachers, I got to um, the stages of the development of trusts. And they said, oh, I started reading the stages, and right away, which stage am I on? You see? It's another, it's the same thing. Which rung am I on? It's like if there's six stages. I've got to be on number five, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, and, and then as you go deeper and deeper, giving into the experience, it's like, damn, I was on... One. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was on five and I was on one. <laughs> you know, but, but it comes with this faith, expanding faith, like you show the way, you lead the way. Let me not... It's almost like if you were a comet, a brilliant blazing comet streaking through the night sky and you started to be interested in your tail. Look at that damn tail. Wow, that's a long tail. That's a... How long is that tail? You know, that's, that's how silly it is when we try to figure out this, the script is written. Because it's a metaphor for I see only the past. It's, it's like, it's just a way of saying everything that you perceive is the past. Whether that's simultaneous past, which I said it's like the unholy instant, is really just one instant. It's not really a line at all. There really is no script uh, from that point. But it is a metaphor, and part of the metaphor is just to point you to the idea that if it's the past, I can never understand the past, but I can forgive it. I can never understand the past, but I can release it. I can never understand how the separation happened. But I can accept the atonement <laughs> that brings me my innocence. And that's my responsibility, is that atonement. So, it's good that you're bringing this up, because I know a lot of people are, are wanting to hear this, you know, where you follow along, but it's like, it's almost like getting stuck on a sticky point. Like you got your fingers in, in the pie, and Jesus is like, now, it's a nice, you've had your fingers in the blueberry pie. That's right, lick the blueberry off and get your fingers out of the pie. Because we've got an atonement to accept. <laughs> and your fingers in that pie are, are delaying you from, from what's, what's required. Like a total surrender. Why would we think, if we still are identified with the world, or the body, or time in some way, how, why would we think that we could understand that? It's almost like, at times when I would, I would get a new kitten, and then I would start playing with the kitten, and then I would start to look, and the kitten would start chasing its tail. It isn't that funny to watch the kitten chasing its tail. But there's something about it that's a symbol to us, like don't, chase your own tail because you'll go you'll go nuts <laughs> if you'll certainly get dizzy <laughs> if you chase your tail and in this sense it's almost like there's a part in there that wants some kind of maybe intellectual understanding and and it won't ever it will never come you will never find something that's satisfying it's almost like mathematicians that are trying to find the perfect 
equation. And in the end, spirit is not an equation at all. They end up having to give up the, give up the, the concept of equations instead of looking for the perfect equation. I just want to mention something quickly between the questions. It's beautiful, we have so many people up here that want to ask questions. But I would just ask, while the seats here are full, if you could wait in your seat before coming up, because it's getting a little crowded up here. <laughs> and then just when you've asked your question and it feels like David's answered and it feels complete, if you wouldn't mind just moving back to your other seat just to make room for the next person, it would be great. Yeah. Well, um, I just guess I have to well give up the whole question of trying to understand it because it it just feels impossible to to understand. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Time is impossible to understand. It it can only be forgiven. And it reminds me also in the in the manual for teachers where Jesus says this is good. He says the ego will ask many questions that this course has no answer for. So that's, that's helpful to hear that from Jesus. The ego will ask many questions that this course has no answer for. How did the impossible occur? He gives examples then of ego questions that, that the course has no answer for. How did the impossible occur? To whom did the impossible occur? And many others. So, I would say, I want to understand the script is written. Like, you're taking a sentence out of the workbook. And you're saying, you know what, I really want to understand that. And of course, that's how we do it, right? We had education. You had education, right? So did I. I had lots of it. I was ten years of, okay, I want to understand. <laughs> you know, that was my mode of operation. Let me understand. What does this mean? But, but... The script is written is a metaphor. It's like a rung on the ladder that's meant to be helpful and then pushed off from, and, and you're, you're to go higher than that. And then Jesus doesn't stop there, though. He says, um, an experience will come that will end your doubting. And, and so we're here to desire that experience. We're here to cultivate just what the gentleman next to you said, I want, to, I want to go into the light. There it is. That's a desire. That's a desire in the heart. And the more you give way to it, I'll tell you, you will less, more and more, and you will not understand what this world means. You know, in fact, you will become so clueless about this world that you will begin to understand that that's what salvation is. I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, how to look upon myself or upon the world. Poof. <laughs> you know, because what was made as a defense against love can never be understood. Sometimes we just want to understand the world, right? We, we want to understand this environment. And it might help us to go back to another uh, line in the workbook which says the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. Do you think you're ever going to be able to understand that line? The world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not. You won't find that in, in the Gita. You won't find that in the non-dual teachings. That's in A Course in Miracles. And people say, that's kind of, uh, wow, that's kind of hard. That's a hard line. I said, yeah. But again, that's not the goal of the Course. The goal of the Course is atonement, is going into the experience of love. Even the Beatles, all you need is love. All you need is to understand time and space. <laughs> da, 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 da. No, and somehow it just doesn't, doesn't ring. You don't get the same feeling, <laughs> you know. But, all you need is love, da 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 da. All you need is love, da 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 da. All you need is love, 
love, love is all you need. You know, you can feel your heart going, whoa. So much for understanding the world. Okay. The comet. There's the tail. Eh, I don't really care anymore. I've got, I've got to go streaking through the darkness, shining my light. Now that's important. The tail? Uh, who cares? You know, somebody says, you've got a tail. Do I? I don't know. I'm not looking back, for sure. So that's the most important thing to remember. It's, it's, a, it's difficult for the ego because the ego is, is bent on understanding something. If you ever like pondered like reincarnation, like try to really figure out reincarnation, it'll do the same thing. It, it, if you go deep enough into it, it starts to drive you nuts. Like, how does the soul get into the flesh? Because I thought soul was from God, but if soul's from God, then that's eternal. How do you how do you get eternity? into something that's so finite and temporary. I never could understand that. I mean, I, I had trouble understanding incarnation. You know, I, I, I mean, it, it was like a rung on the ladder. There was a point in my, my spiritual development where I, I liked the idea of reincarnation because I thought, well, the, all the souls make it back home. And it's just a matter of time. And nobody gets turned away. And there is no hell. And da 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 da. I was so leaping, happy, excited. And then the more you go, it's like, well, actually, how did the soul get into that body in the first <laughs> in the first place? You know, it starts to fall apart because there's something much, much higher. We, we were meant to rise up, and and those rungs on the ladder start to to fall away. So that's. I would just remember where what your direction is, and that that will calm will calm the mind. Thank you, Lainey. Well, I come really empty-handed um, because what we were discussing, like um, the past uh, ten minutes, was actually one of my issues. So, um, but I would like to share what happened when I was sitting here um, I felt the urge to come up to ask about the script is written and the issues I have with it and um, I, when um, when someone was sharing I was preparing in my mind and I was thinking how can I put it and what I, how can I be uh, clear and direct and and then I got the guidance that I was not present, so I was just in my head making up like questions and stories, and that couldn't be helpful. So I was invited to ba to come back to this moment, and then uh, the woman next to me asked this, the questions I have, and I was like, "Oh my God, <laughs> can I still leave?" <laughs> but I got the guidance. Well, this looks like yesterday's movie. Like, there is a script written, and you only have to pay attention now, and you get your answers. You, can sh you get your answers now. And afterwards, maybe you can share it, or you go away. But l listen now. And that was, it, it was kind of a heart-opening experience, that I really can come empty-handed and just can experience. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. That's the second time that's happened in the row where it's like one comes and then the next and the next and the next. Did you notice in the movie last night, pretty early on in the movie, we heard that Chris Johnson's, Nicholas Cage's voice say, the funny thing is, every time you look at the future, it changes. And that changes everything. And then at the end of the movie, again, every time you look at the future, it changes, and that changes everything. And what I was talking about before the movie, I was talking about quantum physics and Einstein and, and uh, spooky action at a distance. But, but actually, that observer 
you know, as long as the observer is the filter of the, the ego, then remember that the ego is the belief that you could change your identity from Christ to something else. So the ego is the belief in change. Eternity doesn't know what change is. Eternity is just forever. <laughs> there's no beginning, there's no ending. It's, eternity has changed less. It's changelessness. It's, it's changeless. So if the ego is the belief in change, and you look at the future, obviously you have to be looking with the ego, and looking through the lens of change, and then everything reconfigures. So this idea we have about script and, you know, that's very linear. You know, it, it, it's, it's a kind of a rudimentary idea. Uh, imagine going into, into dimensions of awareness where, where the baseline is not linear time. It's simultaneity. It's still not eternity, but it's, it's, it's a step where everything is happening simultaneously. You know, that, that doesn't have this past, present, future uh, quality to it. Jesus has really some interesting things to say in the Course about, um, about time in that way. He said, the ego invented time. And Jesus says, there is no continuity between past, present, and future. And egoically, the ego is trying to force continuity onto its own construct. It's trying to make things continuous. So it's trying to say, yeah, the past, and then the present and future. It basically emphasizes the past and future. To the ego, the present moment is a tiny little blip that's squeezed between the past and the future. The ego likes to emphasize the past because of guilt. Like, look, look what you've done. You're a miserable sinner. And then there's this tiny little blip, ineffectual, worthless, tiny, it's almost tinier than a little pimple. It's nothing. And it this guilt from the past, heavy, heavy, rolls over this tiny little blip, and then it just projects on into the future, and you're a sinner, it says, oh, there's a present moment, nothing you can do about that, and then you're a sinner, <laughs> and then you'll burn in hell. Uh, basically, that's, that's what it invented linear time for, and it tries to force a continuity onto that. Now, if we're looking for continuity, why not look for the present? Like you said, be present. That's what Jesus is really calling us to. He's saying, don't get caught up with all these questions about time or about the world or about the distracted device. Come to me and come with me into the present and come with me into the presence. Be in the presence and, and you'll find that that is everything. And the, that's where the continuity is. I always, I even like the word continuity. I thought, oh, I like the sound continuity. <laughs> I like that continuity. It flows. And why do I like continuity? Because it reminds me of connection. I think of connection when I think of continuity. And Jesus is like, very good. That's very good. I'm trying to teach you about continuity and connection and love. And, and that is your spiritual reality. That's what God created you. Eternity is where you're going to find your continuity. And you will never find that in time. So don't even try to find it there. And that's why... In the end, even things that we're struggling with, like interpersonal relationships and looking for love in all the wrong places and in too many faces and all the country songs have been helping us out with that, it's because underneath it we're searching for continuity in the one place where there is no continuity, which is linear time. Thank you. Thanks.
Well, it it happened again. It seemed so important what I had to ask and, and say, and now it being present, it just seemed to have vanished or <laughs> disappeared. And, and my life has come to like radical changes um, once in 2015 when I left the corporate world and I got into my like radical forgiveness coaching business, if you can call it a business or, or whatever. And that seems to be falling apart too. So when the Into the Kingdom retreat was announced back in April or, or March, I felt the call and I registered almost immediately. And as I was buying my ticket, um, I, I'm always very structured, so when I leave home, I always do it for one or two weeks, never more, because I have to be back and I have to be responsible and stuff like that. And this time it was like, why am I doing this? Um, leave the ticket open. Let's see what happens. I mean, jump into it. Um, call it a leap of faith. Just go and, and, and see. And it felt wonderful, just coming here with no plans at all, just the retreat, and then, who knows? <laughs> and then yesterday we had that fear exercise. And I went through it, and it seemed okay, and a few things came up, but not much. And I went to sleep, and I had a dream. And I was sitting outside the reception with my back on the Sunday, not knowing what to do, and feeling really afraid, <laughs> saying, like, I'm having no guidance, I don't know what I'm doing. I was open for this, and now, <gasps> panic. <laughs> Where do I go? What do I do? Um, so, so, so yesterday, um, after Emily talked, I thought, <gasps> Spain, I can go with her to Spain. I can, I can be her bilingual secretary. Uh, help her with, with whatever she needs if there's so much going on. So I walked to her quickly and I said, can I come to Spain with you? And she said, no. <laughs> um, the, the devotional stays are not open now. Uh, we, we were announcing them in a month or something. So it's like, oh, what a setback. <laughs> and right now when I was sitting here and, and, and I was listening to you and my mind was thinking about my story and then it suddenly seemed so unimportant and just trust, <laughs> woman, trust. You've been there, you've opened your heart. Don't let fear crawl back into you. Um, just be open and, and as he said earlier on, Go for the light. Um, and I want to thank you for channeling that light, for showing me my innocence. I really appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Yes, it's so beautiful. Because we, we do just, everything is prayer. So even you saying, Spain, and I want to come with you and everything, because I, I was in the, the lunch meeting, then where Emily said, yes, but Someone wants to come right with me. I said, well, we have to stay open to all things. You know, we're only in the middle <laughs> of the retreat. You know, so we, we are always praying. We, we stay open to these things in the sense that, that there's the divine orchestration and we still take it moment by moment by moment. Even that speculating about the end of the retreat. The ego will dream about those things and this and this, but, but it is good that you just are, are voicing all of this because that's, that's very much a part of how prayer works for us. We come together, we, we hear what's being expressed, what's being voiced. That's one of the beautiful things in that, the front row there is starting 
with this gentleman, and then everyone who's come up has just said, I have fear, but here, I, here it is. This is what's on my heart. I want to go to the light. I want to overcome my fear. You know, it's just putting it out there. And I feel your heart, and I feel, you know, the, the prayer and the steps you're taking, because from your previous life of corporate, where timeline's very important, and even the coaching, that timeline's still important, that there does come a point where you are ready to take new steps, and that, that is very guided by Jesus, and we are in constant prayer as we go through this, even in terms of, like I said, uh, when we talked about Spain and Mallorca, you know, we're just in the prayer of show us, and let it be obvious to us. So it's beautiful. We're right in the middle of the retreat, but it's, I think it's beautiful that you've just brought that and put that on the altar and, and made us aware of that. So thank you. And I know it's going to be spectacular, or as they say in Espanol, spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. So first I want to thank you for being such a wonderful teacher. <laughs> and for being coming into my mind. <laughs> you have a powerful mind. You called me. Absolutely. <laughs> um, last night, the movie... I've watched it before, and it blew my mind then. <laughs> but last night, it really blew my mind. And after the movie, I had a very strange experience. I was feeling um, off balance and not feeling my body at all. And I was sitting with someone telling them, I feel like I'm high, but I haven't smoked anything. <laughs> uh, and trying to articulate it, it felt, the only thing I could come up with was non-locality. Okay, so, and then in that experience, the question came to my mind about the script is written, so somebody somebody asked us. You're in the right row there. Exactly. <laughs> the script is written row. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I just sat with that, you know, let it like percolate. What does that mean? Are we, because I know the Course says that um, don't try to change the world, change your mind about the world. At the same time, anything we look at changes. So obviously it's not linear. So, but anyway, I sat with that, and this morning, the experience I had that was given to me actually is stepping outside of the script. You know? That's the answer. Not trying to figure out the script, but actually stepping out. So since then, I've been feeling out of the script, <laughs> non-local, and time has the concept of time has dissolved a while back. So I put all of those together. Now I'm just sitting with it. And I just wanted to share that since my question was answered anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's good because I just, not long ago, I, I just poured out this whole expression of the dreamer of the dream on Spreaker. And uh, yeah, I've, that has come up on different, meetings I've been, and it's like, just like, oh, this was script is written row, it's like, I'm getting dreamer of the dream, dreamer of the dream, people calling me, dreamer of the dream, I'm the dreamer of the dream, because there's, there's no time element right. in that at all. Which, yes, I mean, no time, I got that, but non-locality is a new thing. <laughs> yeah, no locality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I mean, that's the ultimate, that's what, that really is zooming right into the heart of uh, atonement. And, 
And so I think this idea too of, of just opening to this experience that, that doesn't really have the qualities of time at all is, is good. Just by praying and desiring it um, and realizing that's everything. You know, that there's, there's not, it's not like techniques or steps or all these other things. Those are all, have their, have their time and place, so to speak, in terms of practicality. But, but uh, yeah, giving yourself full allowance and full permission, uh, because in that there, there is no personal perspective. And without a personal perspective, there are no problems. And so the dreamer of the dream doesn't have any, there are no problems in that perspective. And to me that is the simplest, you know, everything is extremely simple, but that is the simple perspective of, of you might say, healing. Healing is. Healing is not a process in that. Healing is not, uh, there's nothing that is healing. It's like healing is, it is healed. All is healed in the, the dreamer perspective. So I rejoice. I rejoice in that with you. Yeah, before I came to the retreat, which was totally guided, and I'm here miraculously, <laughs> without going into details, my, my prayer of the heart is to have an experience that would end all doubting. And this is very strong. I'm sitting here, I'm watching the body do what the body does, the words coming out, whatever they are, but I'm not in the body. And I'm like, whoa. It totally blew my mind. <laughs> and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me that experience. That's a great testimony to, to watching a movie together when yes. it seems like you haven't taken any drugs whatsoever. Your high. body, <laughs> your mind is high, your body is, feels like it's, it's stoned or gone. Uh, exactly. and, and, and all you can do is just kind of observe the whole thing. Yes. Uh, and there's nothing else. So it doesn't matter anymore what the script is written for. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're moving out of that realm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I got a wobble. <laughs> Take it easy. Just walk real slow there. <laughs> Hi, David. Hi, Adrian. <clears throat> when I came on Monday uh, here, I got this feeling that uh, I'm tired. No? But uh, I'm tired uh, because I, I did already so many groups, so many retreats, and um, and somehow I was afraid that, oh, maybe it's one more group, one more retreat, and uh, it's, it's passed away. It's, so it's everything. And uh, I pay uh, very attention what you you are speaking out, né? and uh, to relate to my questions and my my feelings. And uh, I found uh, this explanation, yeah, now I know why I couldn't fit in this world or why I could not be um, happy for a long time because I don't belong in this world. It is, uh, that's the clear uh, explanation for me. It is, uh, yes, I haven't... Uh, no other, uh, no other explanation because I, I have a read, uh, read and being other uh, spiritual, religious and f philosophical uh, uh, schools, no? thought systems, and yes, that's the the the, the, um, the explanation. I tried hard and hard, and this uh, doesn't uh, uh, happen. So, uh, this uh, 
eh, eternal eh, eh, happiness. No? And uh, of course, I have also. Uh, um, it's funny to to hear about uh, meta metaphysics. And 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 uh, I sometimes I, I ask myself, yeah, how can I uh, uh, t tell the other people? It's like these people that uh, is, stay on the corner and, and says, yeah, Jesus Christ comes and so on, so on. Ah, he's crazy or, or anything else. But uh, because. Uh, uh, at the same time, I have this um, need to belong to uh, to an, a group or someone, and of course, I have to, to learn uh, the uh, rules or the thought systems. As for example, I want to play soccer, and I have to learn the uh, the rules. But when I came on saying, "Hey, like, hey, people, you can play <laughs> different," huh? What you're doing here? <laughs> you're playing soccer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, sometimes when I think about it, it's, it's a little bit uh, 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 difficult for me to relate to how can I manage it. No? And, uh, okay. <sighs> yeah. And uh, I think is uh, uh, my big big fear is uh, uh, yeah to lose contact with uh, God and Jesus and myself. Okay, maybe that is here is uh, just a, a, a group or, or no, but because in the past. Uh, I had this thought, nee, I have to belong to this group because that's the salvation and so on. But uh, uh, I, I think this, the approach is not um, uh, correct. Maybe it's approach to be connect ne? and then, yeah, to be connect with God. I think. Yeah, I, I, I really feel like you can really have some fun with this. Like, I used to go to all kinds of groups and retreats and everything like this, and then sometimes you find yourself seemingly at a retreat, and then, but you want to have some fun in your mind, so you think, well, I seem to be at a retreat now, but maybe in my mind I unplug from thinking I'm in the retreat. And I just, oh, I just watch everybody. Ooh, it's fun to watch them all, watch the figures come and go. I don't have to think I'm at a retreat. I can, it's not so fun to think, I've done so many retreats before, I don't need to do another one. I don't have to plug into it. But I still can appreciate and feel the love and the connection of everything. And I think that's part of just for you becoming more and more trusting and allowing and intuitive. Like sometimes I would get invited to go to a place or a retreat and I'd go there and they'd say, here's, here's your bowl and here's the rules and here's the time and here's everything. And then I'd go, oh, okay, thanks. And then I'd go sit up on a mountain and just have so much fun uh, allowing myself the playfulness to, to just observe. And if there's any kind of a sense of the past or any kind of sense of repetition or tightness, say, no, no, I'm not interested anymore in tightness. I'm not interested in repetition. Uh, even with certain structures, certain structures, even like the workbook of A Course in Miracles, they serve their, their place for a time. And even for like 12 steps, we talked about 12 step groups and how, how helpful they are. And they serve and they serve and you you don't ever deny the usefulness of it, of like those steps and, and fully giving yourself over. And then there can be some times where you just start to feel like you're expanding and expanding. And you can just say, thank you steps, or thank you to these 
these steps that I've taken with full gratitude, but it's almost like a child who plays with a toy and then one day they outgrow the toy and they don't even announce it to their parents or whatever, they just leave it in the front yard. It's just, they, you can tell the exact moment that they outgrew the toy because it's right wherever it was left. They didn't think, okay, I have now officially outgrown this toy. Da 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 da! Everybody come see! I am renouncing this toy. I have transcended the toy. I will never play with that toy again. Who knows? They might pick that toy up again. But you know, you know the feeling when they've outgrown it. It's like, eh. You know, <laughs> kids are so great. They don't have to like make a big production. They just leave it on the sidewalk or the front yard or in the hall or whatever. We can do that too. We can have some fun. You can do that with retreats. Maybe you've got all these retreat ideas in your mind and it's a little stale. Ah, this time I'm going to let that one go. I'm just going to have fun and just really enjoy myself here. Enjoy the experience of this without defining it or even labeling it as a retreat. So I think that's where you're at right now in your mind. You, you're going to have some fun with the spirit, some playfulness with all of these things. And there was are, there are something that you said. If you, if you, try, uh, if you try to, to win from this situation something, I lost. And I, 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 I noticed that. Now, okay, it's very fun. Uh, for example, now I, I belong to a church. Yeah? And that was not in my script in this life to join uh, church to belong. And okay, they talk about Jesus and the repentance and this and that. Yeah, yeah, it's very uh, funny. But when I, I try to win something, for, yeah? oh, okay, um, the heaven and, or something else. You know? And then I feel this anguish, oh, anguish in, in myself, and I feel guilty, oh, man seen and this and so on and uh, and for me to belong in this church is a kind of a, a forgiveness uh, lection so just forgiveness and okay I, I I have something in myself that I have to forgive Jesus maybe because uh, he talks in in, in the course no? to forgive himself <laughs> And another something inter interesting that uh, each time I could not finish till now the textbook because when I came to this capital, uh, chapters about uh, a special relationship, bluff, I have a block. <laughs> okay, not this time. Wait, wait. <laughs> Maybe uh, uh, you can um, through it and, uh, uh, later. That is a very um, important issue for me, or I think that's important. That's beautiful. You know, sometimes it's, it's funny when we watch movies and we hear comedians because they, st they love to poke fun at anything. But I remember many years ago, I, I think I was watching a Woody Allen movie, and he said, I would never. I would never belong to a, a group that would have me as a member. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, I like that. But when you think of it as the me, the personality self, why would you want to belong to anything that had a restriction or a limitation to your identity involved in it? But that's, that's such a fun idea. I would never belong to a group that would have me as an identity, until you finally shift the me, the I, to the Christ, which then is all loving, all inclusive, all inclusive. But there are no groups in Christ. Christ is is all in all. It's it's the glory of of God's love. So, yeah, thank you, Adriano. I mean, I've always enjoyed your presence on all of our online retreats, and it's a joy coming here and being in your presence and your uh, sincerity, and uh, every time you speak, it's like 
you know, it's you feel your heart, and you're giving yourself more and more of an allowance to to connect and to feel that love, and and even like being transparent. Many people come to those chapters on specialness and go, oh, <laughs> yes, like. Whoops! <laughs> Not now. <laughs> but that's good too, because that's being very transparent, you know. That again is not, there's no sense of trying to hide it. It's just saying, well, here's, here's what my resistance is, and I'm going to lay it out bare. Uh, I'm not going to try to pretend or hide it. And that's, that's healing right there. Just that. It's so beautiful. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> Ciao. Some cheering feels good, yeah. Um, we're talking about giving up and uh, surrender. Uh, my issue is for now, my, for a long time already, maybe for 40 years, uh, when I leave my house, my physical house, I get worried when I go to events like this. It's always the same. I get worried about leaving it in inappropriate. The gas is still on, etc. Yeah. And um, this time I feel strongly. Um, that I want to give my, my, myself permission to let the, the ego die, really die. It feels like dying myself and dying the persons who are killed because of my leaving the house that way because it's not my house, it's my neighbors and they get in fire and it's, it's, it's insane, but that's the, the, the thought. And, um, yeah, and that feels good, that feels good, it feels very, at a very deep level saying, okay, there we go, there we go, yeah. And like, uh, what's his name, Adrian? I'm very, very ready for fun and, and, and joy, yes. I, I feel a lot already, but I want to get into it full. Yeah, so that's the process. And it feels helpful to share this process. Yeah. Oh, that's I think so that beautiful. is it. Yeah. That's so beautiful. There, there's a line from the workbook that's coming to mind because I think there's all like concerns and worries or even just the slightest bit of anxiety. If you kind of went underneath the feeling, you would, you would still see that, that there would have to be some kind of a belief there. And, and the belief that that there are such things as accidents or random occurrences or coincidences or the hypotheticals like well if i'm not there and something happens and the house it burns you know burns down then you know you think about a hypothetical situation i actually did a conference I think it was a couple of years ago where 
a friend of mine came and we were having the presenters meeting. It was a Course in Miracles conference. We were having a presenters meeting and we're going around the room and everybody's sharing where they're at. And my friend Earl Purdy, who's a Course in Miracles teacher, he was one of the presenters and he said, well, I'm, a, I, I'm glad I made it, but I'm a little shaken up. My, I, my apartment had a big fire in it and I was sleeping and there was smoke all over and 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 I was awakened, so I got out, but I'm here now, but it's, my, my apartment burned, my house, my home uh, is burned and everything. And and it was even so beautiful, just the disclosure of, of the feeling, of the feelings and everything. But underneath, I think, any of these kind of worries or concerns, we'll call them, and anxieties, there's this belief that that there can be good events and bad events. And so the mind is dividing up the world into the good and the bad. Good, the house is still there, everything's safe and secure. Yeah, bad, yeah. it's burned to the ground. And it's not, it's my fault. And that's the yeah. core thing, of yeah, course. Yeah, the core thing. The responsibility yeah. thing, yes. too. It's like, oh, and it, that would be, it would be my responsibility. I would, I would have to answer for it and so forth. And then there's this line in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, and it's, it's, it's short, but but it really is helpful. Jesus says, even in this world, it is I that rule my destiny. What happens is what I desire. And what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. I'm just like, wow, that's, there's no random, there's no, there's no accident. What could an accident even mean if even in this world it is I that rule my destiny? What happens is what I desire. And what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. Wow. Talk about empowering. Talk about the end of victimization. Talk about the end of anxiety, the end of concern. Then it comes back to just what I heard you saying loud and clear. I'm ready for fun. I'm ready for joy. You know, your attention is on the joy. Your attention is on the fun. What happens is what I desire. Well, if I'm coming from that purpose, and that really is something I want, and I have a very powerful mind, an extremely power of, powerful mind, a, a, a child of God mind, that powerful, then it starts to put your attention, it's like, wow, then I really want to focus my attention on what I truly want. And as I pray for that, I will be answered. Again, even in this world, it is I that rule my destiny. What happens is what I desire and what does not occur, I, I do not want, does not, it does not occur. It's, the, it's so powerful because there's no room for some, something else. That t that is outside. It's it's from a, a workbook lesson called "My Capital Self is Ruler of the Universe." People have trouble sometimes doing that workbook lesson. They look at it twice. My self is ruler of the universe. <laughs> None of us learn this from our parents. Can you imagine that at the dinner table? Just remember, you're the ruler of the universe. <laughs> It's so big, surreal. But not, coming from Jesus, you know, we're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the lesson. But what he's saying is that you're not at the mercy of anything, is basically what he's saying. And he said this 2,000 years ago, when he said, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It's just a version of him saying that's what the Christ nature is. The, the, the world of images, you're not at the mercy of the world of images. In his case, even images of the body on a cross, bleeding on a cross, he was not at the mercy of the images. 
didn't change the Christ. The Christ was not a product of images. So I think it's fantastic that, that you're just feeling that feeling of, of opening to the fun and opening to the joy and, and saying, wow, let's, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to enjoy the adventure onto that. And then if anything comes up that isn't fun or isn't joyful, that would be something where you could, you could just question it and say, you know, I, I'm not going to uh, just blindly accept this as a reality because this doubt thought is not my reality. So it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, David. Hi. Uh, I have to go back in time uh, when you were in Horst, uh, North Holland. Now, we had a talk, but there were no questions for me because I only saw the Holy Spirit and the, the, the real world. And it never left me. But after that, it always stayed with me, and uh, it was nice, and sometimes difficult. Then you were in Holland, I just make some pairs, and then uh, a friend of Nada, I asked, uh, I thought she asked, uh, why there are so many white people and only less black people, and you said, I don't know exactly, but uh, for me it was, you, I only see the light, and then poof! I saw only the light. I, I saw, I saw, well, I saw no different people. Only light. But that's that's the real world, you know. It, uh, that's the same. It was just, just a peak or something. I like, don't know. So I was very uh, happy to come here. And uh, so we have to uh, to practice. And then the first one, uh, I find it very difficult sometimes the, the practice because if fear or guilt comes and it's away because. I'm very present at, at, the, at the, mostly at the moment. So, but that, I like that. You know, I like the fear. I like the. It sounds not not right, but I like it. I like the fear. I like the guilt. I like it. I like it. Really, I like it. But with the, with the practice, I have to go to it. For I, it seems difficult to go to go there. But I asked Jesus, and then whoa, it did well. That's very well the first practice. And the second practice, I said, oh, well, I just asked Jesus, and then whoa. I went down, because I asked, let me go to the bottom. And I went to the bottom, wheel down, 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 down. But I was, no f I was not afraid, because I asked, uh, like Nana said, ask your guide with you. So I had Jesus in my hand. Whoa, when I said, uh, but there was no, f I did it before, and I was very f afraid. But now I did, well, there was no afraid at all, no guilt, nothing at all. And I started laughing, laughing, like I did in a, at school, and then I get punished for it. But now I got laughing, I couldn't stop beautiful <laughs> and now now comes my question this is for me it's strange because I was on the bottom it was ready and then, then um, slowly right now for me it seems like everybody is enlightened and I am not because I am the last one so I, I see only light and I have to <laughs> it is so strange this but it, it is beautiful you see everybody is enlightened and I am Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm the last one, but thank you, thank you. Thank I don't care. It's, I, I, it's just words, eh? but there's a feeling. I try to poo. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that's it, because that's how Jesus works. Jesus knows that, that, that to go into fully into the state, we have to transfer the training. And what you just said is... is is a version of what a number of people tell me where they go, I, I can see all my brothers and sisters with such <laughs> love and innocence. Not myself, but I can see them and I say, well, that's good because it's like a lighthouse, you know, that goes around in the dark. It has to do a full, like, 360 turn. And oftentimes the last body <laughs> that we're able to release is the body that we've thought of as ourself. But it's good that we can practice and, and, and build the momentum and build the confidence and practice with others that way. And then it sweeps around finally in the end. We really see that, that forgive, forgiving what we thought we did 
is the core. You know, in the end it does come back to a forgiveness of, of the self we thought we made. Which is not just a body. It, it involves, it has to involve everything without exception. So I think it's, it's great. You're on track and, and you're shining so much light as you see your brothers with so much love and so much innocence and you see them enlightened. It reminds me of a, of a song from, uh, uh, I forget the artist, but he was a friend of mine on uh, Facebook and MySpace, but he's got long hair and a, and a beard and his song, Everyone is Jesus. Everyone is Jesus, everyone. He's just so happy. And he goes around and he, he just gets into the vibe of seeing everyone as Jesus. And he just gets happier and happier and happier. And that's the same kind of a thing. I think it, it takes you toward the light. So that's beautiful. And it's assured that, that you will be included <laughs> in that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, the, it's like the movie yesterday, it's the, of the, the, the pasta, the, the point. It's the point. I, mm -hmm. I, I only see the point. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all. That's it, that's it. Thank you, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's beautiful. Oh. I feel like this little midget or mosquito that is stirring up something again <laughs> with the script is written. Um, there are still thoughts that I'd like to talk about. I, I fully understood mentally what you were saying that we have to leave the past and just soar upwards. But the thought still is I was thinking of a discussion between um, Gary Renard and Jennifer Hadley about the script is written and they were um, comparing it to a video game. It depends on what choice you take, what, um, what the outcome will be. And um, I thought of it if I choose the path of love, the path of forgiveness, I open up to the miracle. If I don't do it, then everything will be a struggle. Um, and the fear is then do I just gloss it over if I still have the discomfort I can't really embrace it there is still these thoughts if you change your mind the world will change and the script is written there is still this discrepancy that I can't get the merging point really even if I can embrace that you say we have or as Mona said stepping out of it Seeing is just the past, seeing the point and not holding on to the noodle like Lady and Lufsen. They are both, <laughs> you remember when they are eating the noodle. Um, so this, this is still nagging at me and it, the fear that I'm glossing it over. If I say, well... I have the discomfort, but um, I can just choose the pathway of forgiveness and then there is the miracle in the future. And this is just so, wow, <laughs> it's, it's confusing. And still, it feels better for me to think along the lines, I choose the path of love and forgiveness. And Jesus promises the miracle. Now, th this was the first part. And the second part, you are choosing the path of love. You are demonstrating it wherever you are <laughs> in every talk. 
with everyone. You are showered by miracles. And what I'd like to know, if you, Steve, <laughs> if you hadn't chosen the path of love, would you have had these miracles no matter what? So there we go. The one is the glossing over that I'm afraid that I'm not doing it right and the other would the miracles come despite which way I choose hmm. well there's a line in the course that that actually really helped me and when I first read this line in the course I just I kept looking at it and I'm like what what does that even mean? What, what, what? But this is the way, it, I said, is this like a riddle or something? I don't know what it is. But the line is, the more you look at fear, the less you see of it. Isn't that a fascinating line? Mm. The more you look at fear, the less you see of it. And I thought, oh. That's good. The more that I look at, allow the darkness up, the more, you know, instead of repressing and suppressing, mm. the more I look at it. Of course, the only way you really can look at fear is with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. You can't really look at it any other way. It's hidden. <laughs> if, you're not with, if you're not inviting it, and you're not saying, be with me, Jesus, be with me, Holy Spirit, then you're actually keeping a lid on it all, saying, I don't want to see it. And you keep it stuffed down there, and then it gets projected out, and you, you see the fear everywhere. But the more you look at fear, calmly, peacefully, allowingly, look at the fear, the less you see of it, the less you perceive of it. So to me, this is why the Course is a path of going through the darkness to the light, it's not about affirmations, it's not about trying to deny what you believe or deny what you're thinking. Even if you have thoughts of jealousy, thoughts of comparison, thoughts of, of grievances and attack, Jesus is like, okay, we're fine with fake, but just don't lie about it. In other words, the Holy Spirit and I know that none of those thoughts are who you are and none of those thoughts are real. But we're good with that. We just want you to don't hide it from us and don't protect it because it won't disappear if it's being hidden. Mm -hmm. So I did, my face was, the face of David was wet with tears. I, th I think through, I don't know, for years in my late teens and into my university years that way, I remember just being, spending a lot of time in the basement just crying with just facing, looking at the darkness, facing the darkness, and crying and crying and crying, like Niagara Falls coming out of the... Niagara Falls out of this eye and Iguazu uh, out of the other eye. And of course, I was down in the basement and I, I was on a couch and my dog, Chipper, was right on my lap, licking as much as I could cry, the, that pink tongue, I got years of the pink tongue treatment. <laughs> like, you cry, you face all the darkness, and I just lick it up. <laughs> you know, maybe it was salty too, I don't know. But yeah. it was like, lick, lick, <laughs> lick. And you know, something about that is a pretty strong symbol of when you're going through the deepest, darkest emotions and you have a dog licking your face that adores you, there's something that it turns it around into like a healing situation. I was just like, that was better than psychotherapy. Chipper didn't even have a fee. <laughs> uh, I'd have been broke with th thousands of hours over years if I had to pay that fee. If, if Chipper was a psychologist, a psychotherapist, I'd have been broke. But well, he just licked and licked. So, Ultimately, what I see is you're on the right track as you, you don't try to use metaphysics like that line, the script is written, and try to do 
okay, the script is written, and uh, and da 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 da. And th I'm not this, and I'm not that, and this, and this. You know, you can't mentally try to like make it into some kind of parcheesi game or something in your mind where you're just going to get the right metaphysics. You really got to just give yourself over to. It's going to look how it's going to look, and I'm not going to judge how it looks. I didn't judge the tears. I didn't judge how long, how many years those tears went on. I just gave myself over to it and said, whatever, I'll, I'll go through whatever uh, to have this experience. Now, in terms of your questions, there can be all different kinds of concepts about if if you change the inner, the outer will change. Mm. Oh my gosh, you can have a field day on that one. Uh, people talk about manifesting. If you change your mind to an abundant way of thinking, mm. then you'll manifest an abundant world around you. Or if you change your mind, then you'll see witnesses of love. If you change the inner, the outer will change, and people even use that as, as above, so below. Mm. Okay. Here's the thing. If you give yourself over to the Course in Miracles workbook, and you start on lesson one and you go through that, Jesus has designed the workbook to show you one thing that there is no inner and outer. That's what the whole point is. You're not going to ever have a question about if you change the inner then the outer will change because guess what? Ideas leave not their source. My thoughts are images I have made. My thoughts have not left the mind of the thinker. There is no outer. I'm simply looking on a motion picture in my mind of, of the thoughts that I still hold. And as soon as you get it back there, from away from this inner outer thing, your problems are gone. There are, Jesus says that there's no world apart from what you think. He says that in uh, Lesson 132. The whole workbook is designed to have an integration of your mind, including the belief in inner outer, including the belief in observer and observed, including the belief in subject and object. All the great non-dual teachings have taught the same thing throughout the centuries. There is no difference between the inner and the outer. So when you're at peace, guess what? You can't help but perceive a perceived a, a peaceful world because there is no world apart from what you think. No, if you're thinking the thoughts of God, thoughts of love, that heals the whole world. Because why? There is no external world outside of your mind. And this is what quantum physics discovered, you know, seven, eight, eight decades ago. And yet, when they discovered this through their experiments, the original quantum physicists who discovered this, they didn't want to publish their papers because they would thought they would be ostracized and they would be thrown out of, of all of science for publishing these findings. But they, should, they just need to apply their, find, their discovery to thrown out of what? <laughs> you know, it was still a belief in a society, a psychological society, a, a group of scientists. You, you see they needed to apply the discovery full, full stop, you know, to everything. So I see that that's where you're at, you know, you, it's not really that you, that, that you have a quandary about the script is written or you have a quandary about the inner and outer, but mm. I think you just have to be very allowing. And that's what we encourage. Yeah, that's, I think I grasp that now. The allowing is really to, to be honest and say, I think the first question I have to ask, how do I feel? Because often when I'm in a discussion, I'm going straight to this, oh, I want to choose this, I don't want that anymore. And maybe that is too fast for me because I'm, well, other people can get upset 
because they have an upset and I should honor that and maybe by asking how I feel, I can see, well, there is still an upset in me as well. And I'm not there yet. It's, it's as Mona said, she had this experience and that's what I want. The ego wants, I know, but I still want it. I want the experience of... I don't have to question everything. I don't have to analyze. I just... As he said, I want to be in the light. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, David. Thank, Thank you. you, all of you. You're just these great angels. I feel that. I felt it yesterday. It's just such a great retreat, honestly. Everyone here. Big hug to you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gertie. And I think, Gertie, you're right on. Just, just remember that Jesus says, the one right use of judgment is how do you feel. Don't, don't skip over that. If Jesus starts off a sentence with the one right use of judgment and then concludes with how do you feel, how do I feel, don't put that as second. You know, because you, you, you have to go there first to make it authentic. If you skip over those feelings, then you're trying to skip into like a mind, mind game, like uh, John Lennon called it, mind games. And, and Jesus has given us the most direct, straight path. He doesn't want us to skip over feelings at all. No skipper anymore. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, David. Hi there. I felt drawn to come up here. Um, <laughs> it has felt like the latest year that I have been coming in touch with a humongous anger. And every time I'm in contact with the light, this anger comes up. And when I'm on a walk, I, I suddenly start shouting really loud. And when I go to my breaks after all the loving conversations and dinner, I go to my room and I can feel the voice of the Holy Spirit just wants to shout. And uh, it feels like right now I can feel what's underneath it. And it's a big unworthiness and a big hurt. And I have noticed that every time you smile, I love to look at you when you talk. But when you look at me, I look away very fast because I believe that it can hurt you. Yeah, you're, you're just describing what we have to go through because it's like the, the anger has been so pushed away. You know, it's, it's, it's not acceptable in society, it's not acceptable in family, it's not acceptable in relationships, it's not acceptable where we work. Uh, it's, it's just not acceptable. And yet, Jesus assures us that, he says in the Course, until you are willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. So that kind of fits with that line I was just saying, if, the more you look at fear, the less you see of it. Until you're willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. It reminds me of those obstacles to peace, you know, when you get down to the fear of God or the fear of God's love. It's, it's so intense that the ego projects it onto persons, onto, onto your body, onto, other, onto the world. You just go for a walk and you start screaming at the trees and, and the birds and everything because it's almost like a volcano that is, is going to erupt. And, and it's almost like, no, it has to go somewhere. It's just, it's, it's too intense. 
Now, in one sense, I would say because you're aware of it, you know, now there's a stronger urgency to heal because most of the seven billion people are, are walking around on a keg of dynamite, but they've got that keg so wrapped up, so bottled up, they are not aware. They may see pictures of Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden and Hitler and go, ooh, villains and vicious ones, ooh, tyrant, ooh, look over there, tyrant, and every, mul or multiple mass murders, ooh. Well, it's easy for them to point the finger, but they're not aware that they're sitting on a keg of dynamite and they've done a lot of work to suppress that dynamite. There are others who are on the spiritual journey who uh, who say, I've been told I'm sitting on a keg of dynamite, but I'm not experiencing that. So they do rebirthing, and they do circular breathing, they do ayahuasca, they, they do psychedelics, they do hallucinogenic drugs, they, they do five straight voice liberations with netta. <laughs> They're like saying, hey, I know you're down there. You've been hiding pretty good. I'm going to get you. If I can't get you with drugs or I can't get you with the breathing, I'll get you with netta. I'll get you. You're not hiding out anymore. I'm going to find you anger and you're going to have to show your face because I am not going to hold on to you because I want to go to the light. Well, the thing about it is, in one sense, I know it's painful, but you're in touch with it. You're, it's not that far from the surface. You're closer to the, to the ultimate healing because you're in touch with it. It's hard to handle, but, you're, but you also have a very strong urgency now with it because the volcano, the lava has come much more to the surface. It's not buried way down under, miles under. It's actually, it's kind of getting close to the, to the top of the volcano. And sometimes some of it spews out there when you're on a walk. When you allow it, you let some of those things shoot out of there and throw a few rocks and some lava out there. I think lava is, what is it, like 12 or 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. <laughs> That's some hot <laughs> flowing uh, liquid there. So, in one sense, still it comes back to the daily practice. Like, like for me, I knew that I may have certain things that help trigger the unconscious and, and those are very helpful. They all have their own usefulness. But in the end, I'm just going to have to go for the slow and steady practice. You know, it's like the old story of the tortoise and the hare. The rabbit may go racing on in high speeds, but sometimes you go with such high speeds that the rabbit has to just finally uh, rest. Not the turtle. <laughs> Think of yourself, I'm going to be a turtle. <laughs> a turtle for Jesus. You know, just... <laughs> yes, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then you look, and you look about everybody else in the room, and they're all like on the Audubon. Zoom, zoom. You know, whoo. They're on the fast track to enlightenment. Okay, I'm going to be a turtle. But I'm going to be a turtle for Jesus. I'm going to practice this and take this stride by stride, step by step, and I'm going to let it come up because I know it has to, like I did with my tears. Like I, and I did know that when I was crying and when, when I got to be so sad, I, I did say, I think there's some anger <laughs> underneath this sadness. And then eventually when I started to really get in touch with the anger, I was really like a turtle with Jesus. I'm like, okay Jesus, we got some major anger coming up here now. <laughs> this is, feels dysfunctional. I can't be around my parents when I'm raging. I can't be around my friends when I'm raging. In fact, it's not really good to be around society <laughs> when you're raging. And Jesus is like, yeah, just turtle right over to this hermitage that I have for you. <laughs> out in the woods, 
and you can take some nice walks and scream. And there's some, I got some nice rocks for you to scream at. And, you know, and the rocks were fine. They were like, rocks were like, we're so glad to be a part of your healing process. You give it to us. Scream at us as loud as you want. Yeah. We love you. You know, so it still comes back to that guidance. Even when it's intense rage, and whatever, it's still, Jesus is still there for us and still will give us things like hermitages or, I, he just said, yeah, you're right. You're, it's best not to be around people uh, during this phase. So here, come here, I'll take you out out where you can let it up without any worries or concerns for, you know, repercussions uh, from that. So that's how much we're loved. And I just would assure you that, um, that you're, you're just exactly where you are on your journey. And it's perfect. Nothing's going wrong. And that there will be this guidance that will allow for you to, to let it move through, really. Almost like if we had a kidney stone, you know, what do you do with a kidney stone? You, you eventually have to let it pass. Yeah. And I'm actually very grateful that it is coming up because I can feel how it has been making me sick and tired for years. And it has been my biggest desire to let everything come up. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're honored, honored that you can do that. It's for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, David. Hi there. I was sitting in the second row, and um, then all the participants came here to sit, and I was listen listening to them and fe feeling into it, and suddenly I saw all these persons expressing their feelings and their thoughts. They are just, it felt like they are my passing thoughts and they came from there and they and they passed me and went over the light and left. And and then When I look, there are still thoughts coming up, and that's my journey, but they're just passing. And I'm, I feel nervous. And I want to come back to the music session from yesterday. It was a very powerful um, experience for me. It was very beautiful to hold the space for my friend. It was very, I felt really the presence, even if other there were voices and all this. It was very beautiful to say yes. And um, and then was my turn to sit and to um, and I want to when when then I, we had to sit on the chair of the love. We had to um, imagine. How is love looks like? Looks like, and and uh, for me came up um, a volcano. <laughs> it 
you had just talked about that, by the volcano, and there came just light out of the volcano. It was like like a ongoing. Pff, mm, light volcano, yes. And, um, and I asked, what, what should I do? And, I, and the answer just let go. And then Things that they are not so important for me, it's pretty easy to let go. (laughs) But then it came to my family, and I dropped them also in the light. And I think I was jumping also in the light. And in the mo, I don't really remember them, but it felt somehow good. Now when I tell it, <laughs> and it, it felt. The, but after the, and it was very like um, just a feeling of the moment, perhaps. But afterwards, there came, I. I tried even to yeah to explain or something and then I just went to my room and I was a little bit lost and then came also this anger and um I could just change some words with Kirsten and it helped me just to 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 find to get the remembrance of the beauty and so I choose just to be in silence and to to not to need no that there is no need to explain somehow it away or make it complicated or and um, this morning I in before the breakfast I was just like praying what what what's going on what's happening and then then i noticed i i prayed for transparency and to let go I'm glad you're you're bringing this up because we've gone through rows of questions and one of them was this idea of surrender and you could say surrender, you could call it release, you could call it letting go and that's one perspective to look at it but the only thing is that that The ego will even try to grab that and that's where the anger comes in. If if you have a a glorious experience of the light and and giving the family 
members over and then yourself jumping into the light and it's, it's euphoric, it's, it's so connected and, and so filled with love, that's all helpful because that's exactly what you're praying for. You're praying, praying for the light to just, like you said, to, to go to the light. That's what you're praying for. But the ego is the belief in sacrifice. Uh, the ego is the belief that going to the light will cost something. And there's a lot of anger uh, attached to that, that there's a cost. And so for me, I, I frequently would have to ask Jesus, you know, help me. Can you free, reframe this? Because I need another way to look at this. Because whatever this sacrificial belief is, it's it's really uh, it's it's painful. And so he said, "Well, think of the ones." And he had me bring family members to mind, and I felt all this love, and another one, and felt all this love and love. He said, "I want you to take the love that you feel for them, and I want you to." allow me to help you spread it and expand it beyond them. Take the love that you feel already and then let's just expand it out further and further. And I want you to think of including all these others into that love. Don't think that you're letting go of love. Think of yourself as opening to expand to accept the fullness of that love. And that's how I, I really see you, Stephanie. I remember when I first met you in Finland, and you came there, and, and you were just so curious, and wide op eyes wide open, and the sincerity of just, oh, I want a drink of this. I want to drink this in. I want to give myself over to this. And then I remember we did a, a retreat up there and you said, oh my, my husband's coming to pick me up. I want you to meet my husband. And so out in the parking area I went and got to hug your husband and then and then uh, not too long ago, maybe it was the springtime, where you just contacted me and said, I want to, uh, is it okay? I just want to, I want to spend time with you. I'm open to whatever that is. You can, you, if you want to come up to Helsinki is great, or I can come down there, and uh, we prayed on it a bit, and it was like, oh, come down, and you came all the way down to Mallorca, and you just came with all your love and all your sincerity to just, again, it's almost like you're taking a dip, coming closer to this love and light that you want. So, what we're be asking the Holy Spirit to show us is convince me that in order to love God, it's not going to cost me anything. That's really what we're asking for. And Jesus, through all of his lessons and all of his teaching and all of his em embraces that he gives us, is saying, God is the love. And when you come to God, you will experience the fullness of love. And what the ego made, if God didn't create it, it, no matter how you associate with it, no matter how you relate to it, it can't be that giving up nothing is too high of cost to pay <laughs> for remembering your Heavenly Father. You know, that, that's the context Jesus is giving us. Whatever you think you would lose by going to God, you really need to question that whole belief in what's valuable and what's valueless. And so this is a convincing, the Holy Spirit has to convince us that in order to experience the fullness of God's love, which is a love beyond words, beyond anything we can imagine. This love is so amazing, so spectacular. But if there's anything that I believe that I have to sacrifice, or that will, it will cost me in order to experience that love, I need to take a close look at that. 
And I remember I was doing the workbook, and I'm going along doing the lessons, and wow, lesson 132, he says, there is no world, exclamation point. I was just like, okay. Then I go on, I'll say, oh, it's in my next lesson. And, and then Jesus says, it comes a point in this uh, journey where it's helpful to bring the student back to the practical Instead of just all of these high ideals and high ideas, it's good to come to the practical. And I remember when I was coming into Lesson 133, I thought, yeah, yeah, you just said there was no world, yeah. Whew. Yeah, let's get practical. Can we come back down? Uh, thank you for Lesson 133. 132 was a, whew. So I come into 133 and he says, we want to be really practical today, so I want to... The, the lesson is, I will not value what is valueless. I said, that's good. Now I'm, I'm happy. I'm back on a practical lesson. So he says, it's helpful to give you the criteria so you can learn to tell the difference between what is valuable and what is valueless. And I thought, that's, that sounds very practical. If I can just get that lesson, I'm, I'm, it's going to help so much. So he starts off and he said, Okay, here's the criteria. If, if it will not last forever, it has no value whatsoever. And if it will last forever, it's completely valuable. That's the criteria. This is him getting practical. <laughs> if, it, if it will last forever, if it's eternal, it has value. And if it will not last forever, it has no value whatsoever. And I'm like, this is practical. This is your criteria. <laughs> you see, this is Jesus. I mean, he really wants us to wake up to that fullness of God's love. And so the belief in sacrifice will rear its head. It's like the Loch Ness Monster. You know, it's going to be swimming, swimming under the surfaces, and then we have these glorious giving over to the light experiences, and then the monster just psh, comes up psh, out of the water, its head comes out of the water, because this, this monster is saying, no, no, that can't be so. Uh, in fact, the ego is saying, yeah, you think you're going back to God, well, that's going to cost you a lot. And, in fact, at one point, how is healing accomplished? You know, J Jesus says, the main thing you have to remember it is the mind and not the body that is the decision maker. So human beings aren't going to decide for heaven. It's the mind that has to make that decision. What will this realization cost you? It will cost you the whole world you see. He's just so direct. He's not mincing words. This is like the highest of the high of the high of the high, just making it really basic and really simple. And so that's what we're going through. But I would like, in, in your case, I think you just have to start to see it as, I love my husband dearly. I love my children dearly. Teach me to radiate that love from those that I love so dearly and take it outward, stretch it out. Let me be, let me have a really good, strong case of Mother Teresa-itis <laughs> where I, I want to see the face of Christ in everyone, in, in the child I pick up off the streets, in the person I meet who I rescue or, or take into my house, I want to teach me how to love in that way. The same deep love you feel for your husband and your children, let me extend that further and further. That's the helpful way to get out of this belief in sacrifice. Because I didn't want to lose the ones that I loved. I want to let them be like a beacon of light for me, like a harbinger of, of even a greater love that's to come. 
And I can think of it that way. I can think of including more and more in to that love. But I, I could never think of it in terms of letting go. You know, that, that seemed to me not the right approach. So I think of it as more, just think of it as an including in. You're going to draw this beautiful circle of love. You draw it around yourself, your children, your husband. And then you're going to start taking more and more into the circle. And that circle of light just is going to expand and expand as you keep taking more and more in. You see how it's an inclusion. It's an integrating. It's an increase in the way you experience love. And that will help wash away this, this uh, anger. Because I know, I've been there. I know that, that feeling. Yeah. No, oh, and you're so loved. Precious. Oh, our time is flying away. Well, we could have both of you start off our session tonight. So everybody can have their lunch while it's warm and cook, and so you can fully use your time. So before we get into tonight's movie experience, both of you can be there, and we'll have our microphone there, and we'll just we'll pick it up at 7 o'clock. Okay, and now, right before lunch, there is a, a closing song to meditate to.
fortune of all that is and never will be. When will you believe? When will you come home to me? Wake up, wake up and see.